Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Hi, good morning. It's July 14th. We made it to Wednesday. We did, and we've all quit a job at some point in at our some lives. Point, yeah. But this is a new one. This one's been making the rounds on the web and even on KSAT.com. Yes, it is on KSAT.com, but it didn't happen here in San Antonio. No, it happened in Lincoln, Nebraska. Yes. Uh, a huge portion of a Burger King staff quit this way. <laughs> yeah, you can see they, they put it there all on the sign. It reads, uh, we all quit. Sorry for the inconvenience. Yeah, this uh, they're going to so they're going to be hiring soon. Uh, it's usually not usually newsworthy when people quit their jobs. This group decided to use the sign to convey that message and it has gained quite a bit of traction online. And this is what they were dealing with. So Rachel Flores, the store's former general manager, told uh, a TV station there that she and eight co-workers put in their two weeks notice because of poor working conditions. So she said that the air conditioning hadn't been working for weeks and the kitchen had reached temperatures of more than 90 degrees. Now when she now she says when she confronted her bro boss, he allegedly said she was being a quote unquote baby. Yeah, so they, uh, Florida says she put up the sign to let customers know that nobody would be at the store and to have a laugh at upper management. Uh, she says they've also gone through so many district man managers since she's been the uh, general manager. Management uh, ownership, not super impressed. They asked them to take the sign down, and eventually I think they asked her yes. for her keys. Yes, they did. Uh, she had given her notice, but then they just asked her to leave. Yeah. So you can't have it your way. <laughs> After all, according yeah. to the headline, I'm not yeah. making this up. That's yeah. what it says here. Yeah, that's clever. Let's look at today's nine at nine. State officials are adding 59 deaths to the toll due to the February freeze. The total is now at 210 deaths. Officials say most of those deaths were from exposure to below freezing temperatures. Metro health officials pushing for more people to get vaccinated as COVID cases rise in Bear County. The spike comes just one week after the 4th of July holiday. Cases are up 11% across the area. COVID-19 cases are rising in nearly all 50 states. Average new cases jumping 97% across the U.S. According to CDC data, officials say unvaccinated people are driving the wave of new cases and are at the greatest risk. Senate Democrats in Washington have agreed amongst themselves on a $3.5 trillion deal for President Biden's human infrastructure agenda. It includes Medicare expansion and funding for climate change initiatives. This is in addition to the trillion dollar bipartisan infrastructure deal. As Texas Democrats continue their retreat from special session, they are gaining a lot of attention in Washington. Vice President Kamala Harris met with the group for the second time in less than a month. Democrats are hoping to get congressional support in their efforts to overturn the embattled Texas voting rights bill. If things seem to be more expensive lately, they are. Prices are rising for just about everything, according to the Labor Department's price index. Prices up 0.9% in June and nearly 5.5% over the last year. Pope Francis is back home this morning after spending 10 days in the hospital. The Pope had half his colon removed. He says a full recovery is still a few weeks away. Britney Spears will have another moment to plead against her conservatorship today. The pop star will be joined by a new attorney after her court appointed one resigned. The Washington Monument is officially reopened after being closed for six months. Officials say only 500 people will be allowed in per day. And that's today's nine at nine. If you were out and about yesterday, you may have run into a shower or storm. But overall, pretty mild. Let's take a look outside with live cam. Uh, we're at 76 degrees, uh, temperatures slowly climbing. Yeah, and it looks like the sun is trying to come out there. We were dealing with some low clouds and fog this morning, kind of murky out there. But we will get some sun this afternoon. We're expecting more showers and a few downpours on the map this afternoon. Boy, yesterday was nice. Those storms came through and it really kind of cooled us down. Let's look at the radar right now. We've got some activity down there around Beeville, kind of similar areas to yesterday, but just not as much coverage as yesterday. So it'll be isolated. Uh, this activity will work its way off to the north and west and could affect San Antonio a little bit uh, later today. There you see some of the showers east of town between Seguin and Gonzales there. And uh, we did have some showers uh, up around Medina County or Uvalde County and up into Real County. Those are quickly dissipating this morning. And I mentioned some of that fog. Uh, visibility is still down about a quarter of a mile at Randolph and New Braunfels as well. So 
This is as thick a fog as we've seen in a long while. Be careful out there if you're traveling. Hopefully this should lift within the next hour or so. And we'll see some improvement, but you can see Pleasanton also dealing with some fog down to a mile and a quarter. Forecast does call for about a 30% chance of a downpour today. Temperatures up around 90 and there's more chances of rain in the forecast even getting into next week. We'll talk more about that coming up in just a few minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. Taking a look at with Transguide this morning, there's a shot of I-35 and now looking at Loop 410 at McCullough. Things running smoothly. A live look right now at the trial underway for Otis McCain is now day three. And so far, jurors have watched the moments leading up to the shooting death of SAPD detective Benjamin Marconi. Yesterday's hearing was delayed for a bit. We watched a juror exit the room twice and what appears to be a cleaning crew came in at one point. It's not clear what happened or if that juror will remain on the case. All right, we've also just been told that juror will be present today. We've also uh, heard testimony from the man who Detective Marconi had pulled over during a traffic stop moments before the shooting took place. Other witnesses are expected to testify today and in the coming days. Today's session is just now getting underway. Erica Hernandez is in the courtroom right now following all the details. She will bring us the updates throughout the day on the news at noon and later tonight. Now, if you'd like to watch for yourself, we are live streaming the trial on KSAT.com and the KSAT TV app. Other top stories we are following for you today. Authorities digging for answers after man was shot in the face overnight. Right now they think it was a random shooting. It happened just after midnight in the 4200 block of Chestnut Hill Drive. That's on the northeast part of town, just inside Loop 410. That man in his 40s was standing in his driveway next to a food trailer when three people in a vehicle drove by and opened fire. The man was taken to the hospital and is expected to be okay. We also want to let you know about a hit and run that sent a man to the hospital overnight. It happened just before two this morning on the city's east side on North Foster Road near I-10. That's where police say the man in his 30s was hit by someone driving a black Kia Soul. He was taken to the hospital in critical condition. The driver of the vehicle took off. If you have any information, you're asked to call police. In your morning headlines, we have a video of a terrifying incident involving a school bus and a six year old and more flooding in the Midwest causing havoc for drivers. Road rage on a highway in Houston and we are back to the bare necessities. David Sears is here to explain all that. Could barely stand not having a bear story for so long. It's been a little while. Yes, wow, got one for you. We'll get to it okay. in a second. But first, let's start with this. Parents, you may not want to watch this, but you do want to listen to it. Little girl getting off a school bus. Watch what happens when she gets down to the ground. The doors close and they catch her backpack. The driver not paying any attention and she just takes off. The child tries to run with that bus, but the driver speeds up. The child ends up get, getting dragged about a thousand feet down the road. That driver finally notices, stops the bus. The girl was six years old at the time. The driver was fired. She and the school district are being sued for negligence. The driver being accused of breaking 16 rules that day, including having items on the dashboard blocking a side view mirror. According to the lawsuit, the child suffered severe nerve damage, has had several surgeries. She also suffers from PTSD. Six years later, the civil trial is now underway. The driver testified that it was all an accident. The loading and unloading of children is the moment of truth. Let nothing distract you. Yes. What does that mean to you? It means a lot to me. And I wish, Mr. Bolas, that I had followed that that day. I can't take that day back. The trial continues today. The girl's lawyer seeking unspecified damages. All right, let's take you to LaSalle County, Illinois, just south of Chicago. That is an F-250 pickup truck, and that is a large gap in the bridge. It collapsed due to some serious flooding. The driver had to be helped out to safety by some good Samaritans and officials say that's the first time they can remember this happening to a bridge in this area. Some of the residents in that area said the flash flood came out of nowhere. Several roads in the area had to be closed. The waters have receded, but that bridge is going to be out for a while. All right, now let's take it to Houston road rage with a gun. You're on board with the driver who didn't want to be identified. The woman was on the east loop Sunday. She was trying to change lanes, but the guy next to her wouldn't let her in. So she slowed down to get behind the guy. Then he slammed on his brakes. That almost caused a wreck. The guy then pulled up next to the woman, and you can see he has a gun. The woman posting the video hoping someone will recognize this guy, and maybe his family will tell him just how dangerous he is. There's that gun right there. 
people need to be aware that something as simple as switching lanes without that person wanting you to can aggravate them and have them pull out a gun on you. Family can let them let him know whatever he's doing isn't right because he's going to take somebody's life over some senseless act. That female driver also plans to file a police report. It's been a while, but I've got a pretty good bear story for you today. This is a bear up a tree. That tree right outside a hospital in North Carolina. That bear has drawn quite the crowd. Nurses, doctors, regular bystanders, wildlife officials showed up, figured oh, I was a young bear and they were just gonna let him hang out in that tree for a while. One of the wildlife guys says, you know what? Later on when the crowd goes away and all the commotion calms down, the bear will probably climb out of that tree and go on his merry way and go back home. Aww. Look at him. You know, those things are so dangerous, but they're so cool to look at. Yeah, <laughs> from a distance. From a distance, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I just like, I don't know. It's not not the in the backyard or on your back porch no, or by no, the pool. But, or you know. inside your kitchen. Mm -hmm. no. no. But they're just, I don't know. Cool. Thank you, David. Right now it's 909, about 76 degrees. Still ahead on GMSA at 9. COVID cases on the rise in Bear County. Metro health officials will give an update later today. Details on when that meeting will happen and what health officials are saying what's behind the spike. And we continue the case at continue rather the case at kids summer safety series. Tips from a pediatric surgeon on keeping your child safe on bikes, scooters, and ATVs. Good morning, you guys. Well, we're also talking about the summer slide. We're more than halfway through the summer, so that means it's probably time to dust off that reading list. So just ahead on GMSA at 9, we're going to be talking about tips and tricks to improve the reading and how it can help your students succeed this new academic year. Stay tuned. 913, it's National Summer Learning Week, and to celebrate Idea Public Schools wants to help your student avoid losing academic gains they made this previous school year. They call it the Summer Slide. And if you have any 6th graders through 10th graders, you'll want to listen to this. Alicia Beretta is live from Idea Nation with educators who share tips on how students can improve their reading. Good morning. Good morning, you guys. Well, the point is to spend at least 45 minutes a day. That could go a long way. Uh, they have these books set up, and this one took me back to my childhood, second or third grade. Junie B. Jones, huge fan, but of course, we're focusing on the sixth to 10th graders, so a little old, older. Principal Stephen Foster for Idea Najem College Prep joins me now. Good morning. With the older kids, it's a little different. Yeah. They probably have a lot of screen time. So for any sixth graders and older, what do you suggest they do so they avoid that summer slide? Yeah, so if you are not looking for a really good book, which there are a couple that I recommend. The crossover is great to read if you're in that sixth through eighth grade range, or The Hate You Give if you're in that eighth through twelfth grade range. Great books. But if you don't have access to a good book, I know you have access to an iPhone. iPhones, tablets. Find a really good article, read that article, talk with that article with your families, your siblings, your friends, and really get them invested in reading those. Not too much screen time though, 45 minutes is just enough to get the dust off those and come back to school ready to go and recharged. And why, do you, why is it so important to have those conversations and just talk about what they've read with their parents or with their friend, whatever they have in their hands? Yeah, so it's super important to read and build your reading skills. But if you just know how to read and don't understand what you're reading, that's not going to get you far. Going to college, you're going to have to be able to comprehend what you're reading. So it's definitely important to be able to think through what you're reading. Wonderful. So again, some of these books that you see here, like The Hate You Give, these down here, these are actually part of the curriculum for IDEA uh, Najem College Prep. Yes. And other fun ones. So again, it doesn't have to be exactly what's on the summer reading list, but something that they're going to enjoy, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you need any more recommendations, reach out to IDEA Najem. Well, I'll, I'll gladly to help you find a really good book. Stephen, thank you so much, Principal Foster. We appreciate your time. And then stick around with us because in the next half hour, we're going to be focusing on the little kid. So more of the Junie B. Jones fans, if you will, and how you can help those students, um, even just reading to them and maybe making up those voices. Because even right now, Steph, uh, Mark, I totally was reading her uh, Junie B. Jones and it ends with, I am not in a good mood from <laughs> Junie B. First grader. That's Very perfect. accurate. Back Adorable. to you guys. We look forward to that, especially, you know, the tips on the little ones. I'll be listening very closely, Alicia. All right, Alicia, we'll see you next half hour. And if you didn't Thank know, Alicia has joined us on a regular basis here on GMSA at 9, which is uh, great news. Yay. And also, GMSA at 9, we have Justin. We have Justin, mm -hmm. and we're celebrating an anniversary of sorts. 
Yeah, well, I don't, I don't know if it's a great anniversary. We're not uh -oh. celebrating. <laughs> We're observing. That's observing. That's right. Uh, the six-month anniversary of the big freeze. Uh, and I, I asked the question, do you remember? Of course we all remember it. How can you forget uh, the snow piled up? We started on the 14th, got the snow coming down here. Uh, we got down to nine by the 15th of February. Saw two snowstorms, two ice storms, just an incredible event, one that will they basically rewrote the record books and it will for a long, long time. Wind chill that morning, February 15th, negative eight. Still a record uh, here in San Antonio, the second coldest all time. So pretty incredible stuff. We're six months away from that, but still feeling the effects in some cases. And, you know, the summer has not been all that warm, so there's some, some good news there. Uh, do want to show you, though, that we have some more dust headed our way. Uh, you thought we were done with it, right? Not so much. Uh, the dust that we've had in the atmosphere does move out in the next couple days, but by Friday starts to come back into play. We got another little plume uh, that should move in. It looks like Friday afternoon into Saturday. Hopefully it won't stick around very long, but we'll notice that hazy sky again. And if you have allergies to this dust, keep it in mind. That's sort of the time frame there. Friday afternoon into Saturday afternoon. Satellite picture shows that uh, we do have some Showers uh, on the radar. These are generally pretty light, but they're around uh, Carnes County. Seeing a little uh, shower, maybe a few rumbles of thunder just east of Carn City and then coming out of Bee County and then a couple more showers up around Gonzales. Nothing here around San Antonio. Uh, we've just got some cloud cover and actually a little bit of fog. There's a little closer look here at town and uh, you see the cloud cover is uh, fairly thick for most of us, but some breaks starting to show up across the northwest side. There's like some of the visibility too. These numbers are improving, so they're better than they were when we started the show. It's about a half a mile, and I think we're going to continue to see some uh, pretty quick improvement there. You can already see the clouds and the visibility uh, improving uh, there on the live camp. 77 degrees east southeasterly winds at 5. Most of us in the 70s, close to 80 at this hour. 74 Kerrville, 80 in Catula, 79 Del Rio, 76 right now in Kennedy. In dew points, I'm not even sure, again, we should mention these, but uh, they are in the mid-70s. This, again, will not change. Here's what the forecast looks like. Uh, we'll get more uh, showers and storms by the noon hour. Some passing downpours uh, that hopefully will keep temperatures in check. And by 4 o'clock, we will see a few more isolated, act, uh, isolated downpours around the area. And this will all die down as we get into tonight. Forecast for the rest of today, about a 30% chance of rain. Temperatures up around 90 with a pretty thick humidity. 91 tomorrow, 20% chance of rain. And what I've done here is just went ahead and put a 20% chance each and every day, with the exceptions being today and next Tuesday. Tuesday looks like we'll see rain chances increase, but really bottom line, we can't rule out these afternoon pop-up downpours, and uh, you can expect that pretty much each and every day, but not everybody will get rain each and every day, guys. All right, we'll be prepared then, Justin. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Still ahead on GMS 8 9, we have a story we tried to bring you yesterday. <laughs> That's right. A double dose of KSA Kids Summer Safety. So next, tips from a pediatrician on what you should and should not have in your summer first aid kit. Welcome back. We are in day two of our KSAT Kids Summer Safety Series. Today's topic, a big one. Items you should have in your first aid kit during the summer months. This includes everything from bug bite medication to band-aids, even instant ice packs. For a look at what should be included, we turn to Dr. Jindy Haug from the Children's Hospital of San Antonio. Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys? Thanks for having me. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Haug. We're good. First, uh, what are some of the items parents might forget to keep in their first aid kit or home medicine cabinet? So actually, what you need to be bringing when you go out and vacation this summer, um, in addition to the things you mentioned, I, I highly recommend including some form of bug spray in that summer kit that you travel with. I think a lot of people um, forget to pack that. Certainly, it's something that can be a problem once you get on the road or you're vacationing somewhere and mosquitoes are all around you. So certainly a deep containing bug spray would be important. Important. And then making sure you're packing your sunscreen. Um, we want to be sure to apply the sunscreen to our kids, keep them safe from getting sunburned. 
we all don't like our summer burns. We want to make sure that we don't get them. But in the chance that you do get them, which can happen, as we know, not reapplying it every two hours, sometimes that can be hard to chase your kids down. And aloe vera would be a great item to have in your summer travel kit, in your uh, first aid kit. And the band-aids that you mentioned, I absolutely recommend having different size band-aids, Sometimes um, we forget to restock uh, our supply and so you'll get on the road and you may have only one Band-Aid in your kit. So making sure that that's stocked and you've got multiple different sizes. But in addition to the Band-Aid, I would recommend getting a tube of just plain old generic triple antibiotic ointment. And that can help, we can apply that to the wound, but only after we cleaned it with soap and water. You don't really need special items to clean wounds. Soap and water is very effective. So you don't need to pack that hydrogen peroxide or that rubbing alcohol. The soap in the water, drying it off, putting on the triple antibiotic ointment to a wound and then applying a Band-Aid to cover it is really all that you need to do. In addition, I love the idea of travel ice packs. Um, any school nurse will tell you a lot of kids can find significant relief just simply with a little ice pack applied to an owie or a boo-boo, and that will help the kid feel better. But I would, um, in the event that a child does have a fever or has significant pain not alleviated with those ice packs, I would pack um, some children's ibuprofen, which is a liquid form of the medicine, or children's acetaminophen. As with all medications, anytime, I don't care what time of year it is, you want to make sure that they are safely put away. So you never want your child to have access to those medications. So if you are putting it in your summer travel kit, your first aid kit, it needs to be a situation where it's locked and a child cannot get to it. Definitely. And then finally, I would recommend maybe an oral antihistamine. So something like a diphenhydramine, um, which is Benadryl, um, or even cetirizine, which is Zyrtec. And those can help in situations when the kids are really itchy or they get hives for some reason, then they can get a dose of that medicine. But the same thing, keep it locked in a place that your child cannot get into it. And definitely helpful, but are there also different things needed based on the age of your child, children, like if they're little or, you know, like teenagers? Yes, for sure. So of course our kids, when they're little, they need the liquid medication. So as they age, I would certainly pack the pill forms of those. If you've got children like I do that range from small to bigger, then you wanna make sure again, that you're keeping those pills safe and locked away. So for older children, you know, they're a bit more adventurous. They may have a tendency to, to do things that are a little more um, daring and adventurous. So again, making sure all that wound care is in that pack and ready to go for the instance that they might get hurt while they're doing those fun things like jumping off tree branches and and hopping over um, all different objects that we have out in our parks and 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 fun places that we go in the summertime all right dr jenny have with children's hospital of san antonio thank you so much have a good rest of the summer yourself all right thank you i appreciate it y'all take care you too as we go to break, we're going to take a live look at 35 at 410. And we've got construction in the area slowing things down big time. Look at this. There, there's also 35 at Thousand Oaks. Several lanes closed affecting that last shot. But uh, again, be advised with heavy traffic on 35 right now. And after the break, a look at why Bear County officials are pushing harder than ever before for more people to get vaccinated. Welcome back. It's 931. New numbers from San Antonio Metro Health show the coronavirus continues to spread in our area. City and health officials will hold a briefing later today to address the COVID-19 uptick. RJ Marquez joins us now here live in the studio to discuss the numbers and what we are seeing in the area. RJ. Yeah, guys, some very interesting numbers here. COVID-19 cases and the positivity rate are continuing to climb in Bayer County. So this comes just a week after the 4th of July holiday. This morning, the positivity rate in Bayer County sits at 11.2%. That is nearly double from the week before. So this is a rate that we have not seen in months. And Metro Health says that testing is down, but the number of cases continue to trend upward. Mayor Ron Nuremberg told us last night during our 6 p.m. Q&A that this does not mean 
mean that we are seeing another surge in our area. This is actually a positivity rate that is being seen largely across Texas. As a matter of reference, when the last time we had an 11 percent positivity rate was back in January, where we had 6,000 cases per week. The 11 percent represents just about 900 cases this week. And then that means that testing is way, way down. People are who are getting tested are largely uh, they, they think they have it and they have severe symptoms in some cases, but largely are the unvaccinated. Yeah, Mayor Nuremberg also saying that 99.9% .9 of cases we are now seeing are largely from those unvaccinated people and people who have gotten the vaccine have been largely immune, including against the Delta variant. Metro health officials say 61% of residents in Bear County are now fully vaccinated against COVID-19 and there is 73.7% who have received at least one dose. So a reminder, Metro Health and University Health officials will have a briefing today at 1.30 at City Hall. They are expected to talk about testing locations and upcoming vaccination clinics and also containing the virus in our area. One of those mobile clinics will be this Saturday at Toyota Field. Anyone who gets the vaccine will get free tickets to an SAFC soccer game. And of course, we will be live streaming that briefing again at 1.30 p.m. today on KSAT.com. And for the latest information on the coronavirus, head over to our website. We have all the news you need on the Topic and more information about vaccination sites and also the latest statewide and national news. Plus, you can sign up for daily updates. Mark and Stephanie. Thank you, RJ. Thanks, guys. And another live look at the trial underway for accused killer Otis McCain. So let's take a quick listen into the courtroom. They were not. The identification is nevertheless reliable under the totality of the circumstances because of the witnesses, A, the witnesses' opportunity to view the criminal at the time of the crime, B, the witness's degree of attention, C, the accuracy of any description of the criminal prior to the procedure, D, the level of certainty shown at the trial, and E, the time lapse between the crime and the confrontation, which in this case was a day. It, it further goes on to say, and it ends with this, an in-court identification will be suppressed only where the pretrial identification procedure created a very substantial likelihood of irreparable misidentification. And then finally, with regard to uh, them claiming that Mr. Enciso just made an identification because the defendant was the only black male at council table, they go on to say, and this is... Uh, they quote three, they cite three cases for this proposition. It says generally a witness who... All right, we are just listening in, and I'm hearing this for the first time along with you. It looks like defense is uh, midway through a motion before Judge Ron Ron Hell. Uh, we're going to keep track of this. Keep in mind, we're live streaming all this right now at KSAT.com, the KSAT TV app. If all goes as scheduled, Erica Hernandez will have an update for you today on the news at noon. For now, let's take a look outside with live cam this morning. We're at 77 degrees and things warming up, but not like crazy hot like we normally have here in the summertime. No, we'll still be below average today. I mean, we're putting together a good string here of days of below average temperatures. It is humid, so that adds to the heat index. But as far as temperatures go, we're in, we're in pretty good shape. One little correction. I said it was a six month anniversary of the big freeze. It's five months, five months since the big freeze. Just uh, little record keeping there. OK, let's look at the radar and uh, we do have some uh, showers and a couple of thunderstorms out there that we're watching down to the south and east of San Antonio. These are generally tracking north, so they're really not on track uh, to move towards San Antonio per se, but they are bringing some heavy rain down the parts of Carnes County. Uh, if you're watching us from the Rungi area up towards Panama Maria, some downpours there. These are pretty quick moving, shouldn't cause uh, many issues as far as flooding is concerned. And then uh, we do see some uh, light showers also developing just to the uh, south and west of Gonzales, moving up towards the Luling area. Temperature wise in the 70s, close to 80 here across Bear County with uh, cloud cover starting to erode. So the sun is popping out and the pollen count molds jumped up today. 960 in moderate pigweed is low and your forecast calls for high temperatures right around 90 degrees, 30 percent chance of rain into the afternoon. Guys. Thank you, Justin. Let's take a look back at TransGuide. We have multiple lanes backed up there at I-35 off of uh, Loop 410 and there's construction in that area. And how are you celebrating National Summer Learning Week? Is it by taking part in some fun activities like a scavenger hunt, an art activity, or what about reading a book with your child? 
45 minutes a day of fun learning could have a huge impact for your student and help them avoid the summer slide. That's right. Talisa Beretta is live from the Idea Harvey E. Najim campus. It's a charter school. Earlier we heard about how students sixth grade and above can improve their learning. But what about those younger kids, Alicia? What can parents do to help them out? Well, it's just about reading, getting engaged with them. So for the older kids, we were talking about 45 minutes a day. For the little ones, because of the attention span, it's a little shorter. But to talk more about that is Miss Hope Walker. She's the principal for Idea at Najim Academy, and that's grades pre-K through fifth. So what do you suggest for time-wise for the kids? Well, what we suggest is 30 minutes, um, particularly for our scholars in pre-K, first and second grade. They may not handle the entire 30 minutes, so break it up in increments, five minute increments, 10 minute increments. And then for our older kids in third, fourth and fifth grade, they probably can handle the full 30 minutes, but make it fun and exciting. And how is it that we can make it fun earlier? I mean, I remember my Junie B. Jones, like such a fan, read every book. So what do you suggest on making it fun? Because for some kids, it may be something that they dread because maybe their skill level is not where it needs to be and they could use some improvement. The biggest way to doing that is involving the entire family. So one of the things that families can do is actually do reader's theater. So they can take a book, act it out pick the characters and let them have fun with it. That's awesome. And for the kids, one thing that you mentioned for the young, young ones, the little ones, is if they hold the book backwards. Yeah, so for our little, little ones, don't get them if they are handling that book upside down because when you show them how to do that, eventually they will take that book and have it right side up again. Awesome. Anything else that you'd like to add? We have some fun ones over here. I remember also Chicka Chicka Boom Boom um, for the kids. Yes. Yeah, so I love, love, love Chicka Chicka Boom yeah. Boom for our babies. So for pre-K, kinder, even first grade, you can read that to them. Do a read aloud to them. Have them listen to you read with that intonation and prosody. And then for the other great levels, I love, love, love the Lola series. So this is a series of books and Dog Man. So for our boys that love Dog Man series. And and then we have Junie B. Jones. That book has been out forever, but I love the series because it allows children to see that character come to life in each of the adventures that they have. Ms. Walker, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Later on on KSAT.com, we're going to have an article with some of the reading books, uh, books that you can read this summer. That way your kid can, can avoid that summer slide. Reporting live, Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Thanks so much, Alicia. Right now I'm reading with my child. She's like reading to me now, but there are some times where she's like, oh, I'm going to read this in my head. I'm like, ah, ah, ah you still need to read it out loud. <laughs> out loud. <laughs> right. I need to hear it. Thanks, Alicia. That is awesome. <laughs> right now it's about 939 and 78 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. Our case at Kids Summer Safety Week continues with a pediatric surgeon. His best tips on keeping the kids safe while riding anything with wheels this summer. We are in day three of our KSAT Kids Summer Safety Series. Today we're focusing on protecting your noggin. Helmet safety while riding bikes, scooters, skateboards, even ATVs. For expert tips on how you can make sure your child or teenager stays safe, we turn to pediatric surgeon and Dr. Ian Mitchell with the Children's Hospital of San Antonio. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Mitchell. First, working in the ER, what are some of the most common injuries you see when it comes to bikes and ATVs? It's a separate set of injuries. Our most common one for bikes is going to be bumps, scrapes, cuts, and mostly broken bones. Um, our orthopedic team takes a lot of care in these summer months and these warm months of children who've fallen off a bike and, as you are often expect, have broken an arm or broken a leg, or that have the minor cuts and lacerations that we see from time to time. When you get up to ATVs, it's also the same types of injuries, cuts and bruises, with, again, you see broken bones, but with the ATVs, you can get up to higher speeds, and once in a while, one of them comes to me, and you see uh, more abdominal injuries. And of course, the big ones that we see hopefully less um, are the head injuries, mostly from people that are not wearing helmets. And we know it's important for a child to wear a helmet during these activities, but how do we make sure a child's helmet fits properly? Um, that's a really important point. Just having the helmet itself is great, but it really does need to fit well. And it's pretty straightforward to do. If you take a child's bike helmet, 
they should be able to see the front of their helmet when they look up like that. So a lot of times when you're out in the world, you may see kids with helmets on, but the helmets are way back here over on the top of their head. The straps should come across their ear, form a Y here, and you should be able to put just one finger underneath their chin strap. A helmet is really well fitted if the child opens their mouth really wide and their helmet moves a little bit, then you know you've got the right fit. So for parents and for grandparents and those that are watching kids out there on scooters and bikes, making sure that their helmet fits in that way that they can see the top and that it's not too loose on their chin and doesn't roll back is the most important part. Um, obviously having the helmet, and we did mention scooters, um, for those that have kids out there, you'll know that kids can get up to really high speeds, even on a non-electric scooter, just one they're pushing with their feet. They're out on the streets, and so the, I tell people the car or the pavement doesn't know whether you're on a scooter or on a bike, so they should be wearing helmets um, when they're on those scooters, too. Say a child takes a bad fall while riding his or her bike, Dr. Mitchell, how do we know it's time to go to the ER? Some of the answers are pretty straightforward. So if you obviously, if you have an open cut that isn't getting any better or doesn't look like something you can put a Band-Aid on, arms and legs that have deformities, that's an easy one. Anytime the kids have a numbness or tingling, that won't go away after a couple minutes after they've calmed down after their fall. The others that you get anytime kids yeah, especially on a bike, but even on a scooter, because I've seen one of those as well, when they hit the handlebars into their guts, most of the time, or into their stomachs, most of the time when that happens, it's pretty benign. But if they have an abdominal pain that just won't go away after a couple hours, that's the time to take them to the emergency department. And the last is, is with their heads, if the kids have fallen down, sometimes they may come back. Maybe they were out riding with their friends. They may come back and seem a little dazed. They may seem a little bit confused. They may not remember having actually fallen. Anytime kids take a fall, maybe they bonk their head a little bit, but if they stay nauseous, if they're throwing up or anything like that um, after their incident, then they should go to the emergency department. And talking about the older kids like teenagers, they can sometimes be daredevils on ATVs. How can parents ensure that their teens are safe when riding? Just as you pointed out, an ATV can go just as fast as a motorcycle and just because the platform is more stable doesn't make it perfect. ATVs like anything else. You wouldn't get into a car these days without, a, without airbags and without a safety belt. It's the same thing for an ATV. People must wear helmets when you're riding ATVs. That's the biggest source of mortality. It's the biggest source of long-term disability. Uh, in teens and ATV accidents is their head injury. And on a personal side, from my standpoint, it's I love riding ATVs, but don't ride ATVs in shorts. You gotta be wearing long pants and you have to have proper footwear. I know it's hot out there in Texas in the summertime, but I personally have taken care of plenty of kids that have needed. Well, hello. Uh, let's jump right into weather now. Uh, good information, by the way. Uh, let's take a look at the month of July. It has been a pretty good month of us as far as temperatures are concerned. We've been below average every day so far this month except for one, and that was July 3rd where we got up to 95 degrees. But the average high so far this year, 88.5. Considering the normal average is 95, we're doing pretty well. Yesterday was great. We had some storms move through, cooled us down some and temperatures only made it up to 89 yesterday. Here's a look at the live radar. You'll notice there is not much going on here around San Antonio. Big picture though does show that we have some activity that uh, had developed there in Bevo. That's falling apart. A few more showers, maybe a storm there in Carnes County. A little closer look, Carn City. You're missing out on the rain. It's just your east, but Rungi, a little shower there, and that's all tracking off to the north. As we get into the afternoon with some heating, there's enough moisture there where we should get some more scattered to a uh, little isolated downpours. Let's call it that. I think about a 20 to 30 percent chance of rain today. And you can see some of those showers developing on the coast. Looks like the sea breeze already getting started. We've had a lot of cloud cover here in Bear County, and we did have some fog earlier. Most of that has lifted, with the exception being out towards Randolph, where we're still looking at three quarters of a mile visibility. But uh, everything should lift here very very soon and we're starting to see some sun here on the live cam 77 degrees at the airport 79 Stinson 79 Kelly 
and looking at 75 Randolph Southeast Julie winds anywhere from 5 to 15 miles per hour. Uh, the satellite picture shows clouds are again breaking up Hondo Kerrville. You're seeing sun at this hour. Still some cloud cover though around New Braunfels and along the I-35 corridor there. Temperatures 75 in New Braunfels, 75 Bernie Stage, 76 Kennedy, 80 right now in Catula. And here's a look at the forecast for today. This does show showers and a few thunderstorms developing, although this looks overdone a little bit. This is not how the radar looks. So I I think this is probably overdoing it just a bit, but it does get the general general idea that we should see some more isolated activity. I think best chances today probably east of I-35 and we'll go partly cloudy during the afternoon. Most of this activity will die down tonight once we lose our daytime heating forecast for the rest of today will warm up to about 90 30% chance of rain during the afternoon hours and the extended forecast. 20% chance of rain coming up tomorrow, 91, 92 Friday. Uh, there will be some of that Saharan dust working back in Friday and the Saturday, so I'll caution you there. Temperatures remain in the low 90s, and we went ahead and added rain chances basically every day during the seven day. It's not going to be, the, the radar is not going to be busy every day, but we'll have some of those pop up isolated showers each and every afternoon. And I think as we get into the middle part of the next week, what a better chance for rain. Frontal boundary potentially tries to move south, which would be fantastic. Maybe not move through, but kick up some rain chances uh, middle part of next week, guys. But it's nice to see the low 90s instead of triple digits. It's pretty incredible so far. Thank you, yeah. Justin. 951, about 78 degrees. And would you eat your mac and cheese frozen? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not, but now you can thanks to a new treat created by Kraft. <laughs> good morning. Hey guys, good morning. Coming up on live, Curtis 50 Cent Jackson talks about his series Raising Canaan. Plus, Amazing Kids Week continues. See you soon here on live. And just a reminder, we are live streaming the trial of Otis McCain right now on KSAT.com and the KSAT TV app. So it looks like they are someone on the witness stand right now. And of course, you can check our streaming devices for the latest. We want to circle back to traffic real quick. Uh, we've still got major problems on I-35 right now due to construction. Looks like crews have traffic down to one or two lanes a little further there in the distance. But traffic definitely stacking in uh, one direction there. Uh, fairly close to 410, slow going 35 and Thousand Oaks. Earlier today, we told you about like a combination that uh, I'm not really a fan of. You may have heard about this today. It's National Mac and Cheese mm -hmm. Day, and Kraft has collaborated with a company called Van Leeuwen mm -hmm. to serve up macaroni and cheese flavored ice cream. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're already feeling like that, uh, we were running something earlier, and uh, the price, it's actually $12 per pint. $12 a pint. The soft orange hue that makes the iconic elbow-shaped pasta pop is made with paprika, annatto, and turmeric, according to Kraft. Yeah, the brand removed the artificial flavors and dyes and stuff. So I know you wouldn't pay for it. If we bought it for you, would you try it? Oh, would you try it? I'd try it. But you wouldn't $12. buy it at the grocery oh, store. I know, that's a lot. 